like I was mentioning just a, just a moment ago, we are in week number two of this You Asked For It series. Been a, it's going to be an interesting one. It's been interesting so far, the anxiety message, a lot of feedback from that from last week. Pastor Eric did a great job on that. And if you don't know what we're talking about, a couple of weeks ago was obviously Easter. And what we do every Easter here at Corners, Cornerstone is we, we hand out these surveys, we call them. And uh, it's got a bunch of questions on the back. And uh, some of the questions are like, what are the greatest areas of stress that people experience? And there's a, there's a bunch of check boxes here. And it's like marriage, stressful, current events, parenting, stressful. How many of you know parenting can be stressful? Economy, uh, all this different stuff, finances, and et cetera, et cetera. And then there's another question on here, which is what are the greatest barriers to knowing God? And this is like a write-in one. And um, I went and I was looking at, as we were kind of coming up with topics for this series, I was looking at last year's results. We had the the survey still. And then this year's results and going through all the write-ins. This is a write-in, by the way. Um, Something something was just popping off the pages, like one after another at me. A lot of people were were saying the same thing. So uh, this is just like, this is is a sample. This is only from, uh, I think, two of the five services. There's a bunch here. And let's, let's read what it says, okay? So what are the greatest, greatest barriers to knowing God? Time. Time or lack of priorities. Finding time to rest in the word. Prioritizing time for him. Time, 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 time. Spending time daily. Taking time to read the Bible. Distractions, time. Laziness, time. Spending more time, making him the priority above all else and time. Man, all kinds of time, distractions, time, time. You get, the, you get the point, right? It came up again and again and again, prioritizing time with him. And then finally, what are the greatest, greatest barriers to knowing God? None of your business. <laughs> Thank you. Gotcha, kid. <laughs> uh, and, then, and then, of course, um, you know, on the front side, it has people put their names. Like, sometimes they put their names, sometimes they don't. So the none of your business person, their name is Cupcake Head. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not joking. I'll get this. You can pass it. So if you are Cupcake Head, I want to talk to you afterwards. I actually want to see your license. I want to see that it says Cupcake Head on your license. Yeah, that was a funny one. You're looking through those. Oh, there's a picture of Cupcake Head, too. That's cute. Anyway. <laughs> So yes, talking about time, talking about time and time management, it came up again and again and again. And that's just from this year. I mean, we've had like 10 Easter services in the last two years, and they all did the surveys. And again and again and again, it was time, distractions, uh, social media and time and all this different stuff. So I think that it's safe to say that this week, maybe it's time to talk about time. All right. So time is the ultimate limited resource. The ultimate limited resource. Every one of us has the same time budget. That's 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, giving a total of 8,760 hours for each year of our lives. And everybody gets that. Each year of our lives, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, 8,760 hours per year. That's a lot of time. The, the ultimate limited resource, and that really means like, you know, another resource would be, would be money, right? And everybody kind of likes to have a, a, enough money at least. And, and some people collect money and some people stack money. And, and as you get older, right, some people's money grows longer and longer. But time is the ultimate limited resource because you might be, you might be with a big, long bank account. But when you're running out of time... How many of you know you would trade that whole bank account for extra time, another day, another year, or whatever that it may be? If we could buy time, often we would. You can't. It is the ultimate limited resource. So when talking about time, we got to start with the obvious. So forgive me for starting with the obvious here. When we're talking about time in the Bible, we got to start with the obvious. And that obvious is that God, God himself is timeless, exists outside of time. It's not, it's not prone to like aging and getting old like we are. It's not going to pass away someday. In fact, the Bible says that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is eternal, is timeless, everlasting. There's a, there's a scripture, uh, Psalm 90, 
verses one and two, it says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place. I think this is Moses. Lord, you've been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, before the mountains were born, or before you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And that's amazing. That's amazing because that was written by someone who was a member of a, of a people group who was enslaved for like 400 years and then spent many more years afterwards nomadically wandering with no place to really call their home. And what do they say about the Lord? This says, Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Even if I don't got a place to sleep, even if we don't have a place to call home, you are our home from everlasting to everlasting. Super powerful, right? That's pretty cool. Now, in contrast, right, we talked about God being timeless. In contrast, another obvious one, humans are on a timeline. So God is timeless, but humans are on a timeline. Uh, Psalm 39, verse 4, Lord, remind me how brief my time on earth will be. This gets a little bit uncomfortable. Remind me that my days are numbered. Usually we say that as a threat. Your days are numbered. Remind me that my days are numbered how fleeting my life is. Verse five, you have made my life no longer than the width of my hand. This was like a unit of measure for them. That's like saying my life is like maybe, maybe a couple of feet and a couple of inches. My entire lifetime is just a moment to you at best. Each of us is but a breath. That's heavy. Each of us is but a breath. And it reminded me of this guy that I, that I was talking to. This was years ago. I met him through a friend of mine. And uh, we're just like out in the street hanging out or whatever. This was in Los Angeles many years ago. And it's like small talk. You meet somebody, you talk to them. And like, I forget how it came up. But it was like, how old are you? Kind of came up. And at the time, I was like 25. And, and this guy was older. And we're just like talking in a group of people. And I was like, how old are you? And he, and he starts, and he's looking at me in the eyes because we're having a conversation. And he's like, oh, I'm, I'm I said, I'm 25. He says, I'm 50. And then he's like looking at me and then his, and I'm watching this happen. His eyes like glaze over a little bit. And he's like, I'm 50. He's like, actually, I just turned 50. He starts looking away. I just turned 50. And he's like, he starts to like kind of wander. He's like, I, I, I actually can't believe I'm 50. I, I feel like inside I'm still, I'm still 20 years old, but I'm 50. And this guy was having like an existential crisis right in front of my eyes. I was watching this guy have a crisis as he was slowly realizing that he was 50 years old. It didn't feel real to him that he was 50 years old. And when I was 25, I mean, I, I, was, just, I was just looking at that saying, I, I, I'm 25, like I, that's, that's, that's old, man, 50 is old. And now that I'm closer to 50 years old, let me tell you, things have changed and I kind of understand that guy a little bit. Um, yeah. I was thinking about this message and I was prepping for this message and, and um, I guess I'll ask a question. How many of you guys, if you closed your eyes right now, how many of you could picture the, the, the place that you grew up in, whether it's a home or an apartment or whatever it is, like you could picture it. You picture what it looks like if you closed your eyes right now where you grew up. And, and I, was, I was preparing for this message thinking about time and thinking about our life being like a breath. And, uh, and I ended up on Google Street View and I was looking up like the house that I, that I grew up in my first couple years of life. And I found it on there and, and uh, I was looking at it and, and it was like literally a, a trip down memory lane because I'm on Google Street View, walking down the street in Google Street View of the street that I used to walk down when I was a kid, when I was little. I was riding my little like big wheel or whatever down the street in this, in this area. And I'm looking at the house that I spent the first years of my life in. And I'm, and I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about, wow, that, that's totally changed, and that tree is gone, and this thing is new. And then I'm looking at it, and I'm saying, wow, that's still the same. And, and that other piece, like the, the driveway hasn't been paved. I haven't been in this house in 30 years. But there was something special, right? Like if, you, if you've grown up someplace, sometimes like you can think about it, close your eyes, and you're like, there's something special there. And I remember I was looking at that picture in Street View, and I'm looking at the, the rooms a little bit, and I'm like, oh, my room would have been up there. Like that's where I would have, would have been sleeping. And then I'm, that's where we go in the front door, and it was kind of like a little sitting area. And then I was thinking, and that's the room in the back where someone like, man, someone very special to me used to be, Right? And I'm sitting there thinking about time and the message and like our life's being like breath. And man, it was, it was, it was, it was a little bit emotional, right? There's someone that I love dearly that's no longer with us living in that house once upon a time that I was looking at in Google Street View. Time goes on 
And sometimes you lose what is beautiful, right? It's true. And many of us have felt that. Many of us know that pain. It's a, it's a difficult pain. And if we ruminate on that and we ruminate on all the things and all the people and all the beauty that we've lost, that can become overwhelming and even depressing. But it's important in a way because it helps remind ourselves how fleeting life is. It's here today and it's gone tomorrow. God, what am I going to do with the time that you've given me? I don't want to waste it. I don't want to be 70 years old talking to somebody someday and be like, I can't believe my life has is, is passed me by. James 4.14 says, how do you know what your life will be like? Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are like a mist that appears for a little while and then it vanishes and whenever I hear that verse, I'm always thinking about the times where I'm like driving into work or, or bringing my kids to school or something. And you're driving in, it's early in the morning. And, and in the morning, it tends to sometimes be like very foggy. And you'd be driving through this fog and it's maybe seven o'clock in the morning. Sometimes it's a real thick fog, seven o'clock in the morning. But how many of you know, sometimes by like 7.15, 7.20, all of a sudden that fog is just gone. And it's almost like it never existed. Our lives are like the mist, the morning mist here today and gone tomorrow. Now, I remember there was, a, there was a, some years ago, I was driving home from work. It was probably like 11 o'clock at night, 1130 at night. Uh, it was a late night and I was driving on this, on this route. It was like a, it was kind of a backwoods, 50, 55 miles an hour route. And it was straight, pretty much straight as an arrow. There was no other cars on the road. It was late. It was backwoods. Like I'm saying, there was no street lights, So it was very dark. And I was driving along, I was cruising along, I'm just trying to get home. I had like a 35 minute ride home, I'm just trying to get home. And down in the distance, driving this dark route in the middle of kind of nowhere, I see, I see in the oncoming lane what looks like, a, it's like a little like light, it looks like a little flashlight or something. And I'm cruising along and I know it's in the other lane, but I'm like, I'm gonna slow down a little bit just in case. And as I kind of got closer, I was looking at it and I couldn't make out what it was. I'm looking at it. I'm like, somebody walking in the road? Is something, what's, what's over there? Is it a moped? Is it a dirt bike or something? And as I came closer and I'm looking at this light and I'm coming like close to it. I'm still, you know, going decent speed. I'm not going 50 anymore, but I've cut it and probably maybe down to 30 or something. All of a sudden out of the darkness in front of me in my lane, it's like this thing becomes visible quickly and clearly. And it is a parked car in the middle of the road on a 50 mile an hour dark as night route and it's just parked across my lane and the light that I'm seeing that I thought was a little flashlight or a little moped light or something was was the corner of this of their headlights that I could barely see because their lights were facing a different direction and it was one of these like small town kind of a roads where it was actually at an intersection there was like that single light you ever you ever come to like those little single lights that are sometimes in the small road and I had the green lights and this person was like at a T, right? It was an intersection like a T. So they had a choice to go right or left and they chose neither. They, for some reason, chose to park right in the middle of the road at like 1130 at night in the dark while people are barreling down that road. It was, it was very dangerous. So I, so I ended up slowing all the way down and I, and I caught it barely in time. And, and as I was like just going to pass it, I was looking into the, into the, I was like trying to see what was going on. And the window was down and I looked inside and I, and I saw someone inside and they were, they were very, very old. And actually, as I, they weren't moving and I was like, oh my gosh, this person has passed away. And they're, and, they're, and they're in the middle of the intersection. So I pulled around and I stopped and I jumped out of my car and I ran over there. And as I'm like walking up to this car, I'm like not sure what I'm gonna see. I'm like, sir, sir, sir. And I'm walking up to this car and it's not responding to me. And I'm like, man, this person is, this person is for sure dead. And as I'm about to like make the phone call or figure out what I'm going to do, try and get that car out of the road, I, I, I'm looking at I'm like, sir, sir, I'm thinking about making a phone call. And the, and the person turns to me and shocks me because I thought this person was dead. It was like a jump scare. And, and, he, and he looked at me and I saw that this person was like probably literally like 90 something years old, probably like 90, 95 years old, very, very elderly man. He was an African-American man. He looked at me and he was very disoriented. He didn't know where he was. He was talking to me, but it wasn't making a lot of sense. It's very sad. Uh, talking to me, not making a lot of sense. He was disoriented. And I was like, oh, sir, you know, um, you know, we got to get you out of the road, right? So, so I was trying to talk to him, and, and he was kind of in and out, and he was able to put his car into gear and get it off the road, and we pulled into, like, this little, this little old, uh, I think it was a closed gas station at that time, and parked it over there, and I was trying to talk to him. And it was just, he was like, where, where's, where's, where's the highway? Like, where am I? Like, all this stuff. And I was like, man, this is not good. So 
uh, I, I didn't know what to do, so I called for help, right? I called for help, and, and uh, as, as we're waiting for, for help to arrive, you know, wasn't really able to talk to him because he wasn't really coherent, but I was praying for this guy, and I was looking at him, and I'm like, this guy, I was just really looking at the details of him, and he's like 95 years old, 90, 95 years old, African-American man, and, and you get to this point where, like, sometimes when you age, you know, your, your, your skin kind of, kind of, you know, maybe maybe sags or something, and, your, and your, your bones become very apparent. And that's why I thought that he had passed, because he was just very, very old. And I was looking at him, and he was wearing a, a, a Korean War veteran's hat. And he's obviously a man who was very proud of his service. And at that point in time, the Korean War had been probably 70 years ago. So this man had lived like probably 70 years after coming back from that war. And I went to the back of his car, and I saw that his license plate had a purple heart designation on the back on the plates and my, my heart was like breaking watching looking at this guy trying to talk to him waiting for help to arrive and the help arrived and they talked to him we did like a handoff and I ended up you know I ended up getting in my car and, and driving my, my long way home on this dark back roads route and it was just like playing over again and again in my mind this guy this guy and I'm thinking this guy in his hat his veteran's hat he's seen some things he's been through some things he's got the purple heart plates he's probably been 70 years a veteran a proud veteran what was it like for him I'm wondering when he came back from the war? What was his family like? Did he come home at the end of a long day after he came back and he had a job and was his wife waiting for him there and his kids running over and grabbing him on the legs and saying, Daddy? And 70 years goes by and this man finds himself in, a, in an intersection in the middle of the road. At the end. And as I'm driving, I'm thinking about how he put his keys in his car for the last time and didn't know that it was last time and he went for his last ride and he didn't know it was his last ride. And somebody took his keys away at the end of that and that was it for him, no more rides. And I got to thinking, man, we're all gonna have a last ride someday. Someday I'm gonna come home, I'm gonna take my keys out of my pocket, I'm gonna put them on the little table when I come in and I'm not going to even know it, but that's going to be the last time I put my keys down. That was my last ride I just took. And I was thinking about his life, and I was thinking about my life, and I was thinking about all of our lives, how everybody's going to have a last ride someday. You might make it to 95 or 105. You might only make it to 25. But everyone's going to have a last ride someday. And I was thinking about the time that he had and what he did with his time, and then I was self-reflecting on the time that I have and what have I been doing with my time What do we do with our time? As I was prepping for this message, I was looking through statistics. Did you know the average American spends around seven hours on the screen time per day? Three and a half hours of that is on our phones, on average. Did you know that the nine to 14 year olds spend an average of nine hours a day on screens? And that does not include for educational or work purposes. That's just straight up nine hours of screen time on average for nine to 14 year olds. All this data is according to multiple places, data reportal, the CDC, Statista, and the BBC. This is all from them, nine hours a day. They're not working, and that doesn't include educational usage. These are unprecedented levels of screen time, and we also have, as we talked about last week, unprecedented levels of anxiety happening in our culture at the same time. Do you think that's a coincidence? Maybe not. So what are we supposed to do here? You see all these people, all these people. I could probably take three times, four times as many as this over the last two years, and it's all people saying, time, I feel like I'm, I don't have the time. I feel like I don't know how to manage my time. I feel like I'm distracted. I feel like I'm lazy, whatever it is. Everybody's talking about time. So what are we supposed to do here? How do we better manage our time? Let's talk about a couple of practical ways we can do it. One, we can better manage our time by prioritizing what is important. Prioritizing what is important. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. First, seek first the kingdom of God. There's ways that we can do that. We can, we can read scripture. We can pray. We can even be like serving in the name of Jesus. There's, there's different ways that we can prioritize what's important. And really, spending time with God is or should be important. 
People ask me from time to time, and this was some of the answers too, but people ask me from time to time, like, I don't know where to begin. I don't know, I don't really know, like, there's all these translations of the Bible. I don't, I don't know what I'm doing here. And I always answer them, if they ask me, like, what, what the best translation is, I, I say, well, the best translation is the one that you're going to read. You know, and if it's, and if, and if you like, if you like the, 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 you know, Shakespearean, be thou beseecheth thee, or whatever, of the King James Bible, then go for it. That's great. Or if you want something a little bit more modern and conversational, you can try like the NIV or the NLT. There's different things that you can do. But the best translation is the one that you'll actually read. I like to recommend that people use a paper Bible versus a phone because, yes, there's great things on the phone, and it's absolutely like, you know, the Bible app and multiple things on the phone that are awesome. But when you're reading your paper Bible, it's much less likely to give you notifications from Instagram. True. Sometimes, sometimes people say, and this has happened to me, sometimes people say, I, I read the Bible, but I don't understand it. I don't feel like I get anything out of it. I don't even know what I'm reading. I feel like I'm just, like, like I'm time warped. All of a sudden, I'm closing the Bible, and I read, I read two chapters, and I have no idea what I just read. And to that, I would say, you can incorporate some prayer into that. Prioritize that, that what's important, which is prayer. And you just say, Lord, I'm going to open my Bible today, God. And a lot of times, I'm going I'm to be honest with you, Lord. I don't, I don't get it. I don't understand. But, Lord, that you would take this time that I'm setting apart to you right now, where I'm trying to seek you in Scripture, God, that you would give me understanding, that you would give me your wisdom, Lord, that this word would mean something, that you would reveal it to me, open my eyes, and make it fruitful in my life. And then you start reading the word, and all of a sudden, don't be surprised. These things are jumping right off the page of you because that's how God works. Invite him in to your Bible reading. Pray, prioritize what's important. You can also serve. Jesus modeled servanthood. That's important. Jesus was sitting around a table with his, with his 12 disciples. And the God that created the heavens and the earth took time and said, okay, I'm going to get a bowl of water and use my own robe. And I'm going to go around and wipe and clean the dirty feet of the fishermen and the guys who are at this table. And I'm not doing it because it's a good time. I'm doing it because I'm trying to model servanthood. It's important. Jesus modeled a servant. We call him the suffering servant. And if we're followers of Jesus, then we should follow his example. Prioritizing what's important should probably include serving in some way or another. It doesn't have to be some crazy thing. It doesn't have to be like a, like a, like a marathon of doing something, something huge. How long do you think it took Jesus to, to wipe clean Peter's feet? It probably took less than two minutes. There's a place in the Bible where Jesus says, I tell you the truth, whoever gives a cup of water to the thirsty in my name will not lose their reward. How tough is it to give the cup of water to a thirsty person? Sometimes I think we, we, we overestimate how much serving is going to take. Sometimes it's just a natural flow. The second way that we can better manage our time is by developing a routine. Did you know 15 minutes, how many, how many hours a year was it? It was like 8,760 hours a year. Did you know 15 minutes a day, just 15 minutes a day in scripture reading is 90 something hours a year. And how many of you going from maybe zero to 90 hours of the living and active word of God doing and producing fruit inside of you? How many of you know that's gonna be a huge improvement and a big deal? 15 minutes of day makes a difference. Develop a routine. Attend church regularly. Try and make it a can't miss as much as possible thing. It's like sometimes church, and I've been there as well. Like I've been on the other side. I was in, I was in the, the trades for many years, right? I wasn't always this side of the pulpit. I was in that side of the pulpit for years. And sometimes coming to church I would come to church and I'd kind of have the attitude of like, all right, like what's in it for me today? I'd show up and I'd, I'd watch the worship and be like, oh yeah, I like that song. And then they play the next song and be like, oh, I hate that song. And I'm kind of like waiting to be like entertained, like, like show me something great. All right, preacher, like preach something awesome or whatever. And I'm missing the whole point because the whole idea of coming to church is not to be served and entertained, but to bring some kind of an offering to the Lord. And I'm not just talking like financial. 
right? So many times, look, look, I, I work at the church, right? Like I hear these songs at least, at minimum, three times a week, at least, and probably more like five or six times between here and rehearsals and driving in my car and my kids and my wife and just in general, I hear these songs all the time. Believe me, there are songs that I like better than others. There are songs that I wish that we could fire into the sun and never sing again. I guess it's a good thing those songs weren't written for me. Right? They were written for somebody else. And if the song comes on and I don't like it, Lord, help me lift up my hands and worship you anyway. Because I can count my blessings rather than singing a song. They can sing the song. I'm just going to worship. Lord, how great you are. I want to remember your amazingness. I want to bring an offering of praise to you, even if I don't feel like it. There's people all over the world, when they come to church, they come with the idea of, I want to bring something to the Lord today. I'm going to bring my praise and my worship. I want to show my faithfulness and my love or whatever that it might be. But develop a routine and the third way that we can better manage our time, this is going to sound kind of like an oxymoron, but we develop our time. we got to find the time. We have to find the time. People, when they, when they prioritize, like, I want, to, I'm going to, I want to get buff, I want to work out, we will prioritize going to the gym. I mean, some people will, not me, but some people will prioritize going to the gym. <laughs> oh, I'm going to drive home. i got to stop at the gym on the way home. Oh, I'm going to go, I'm going to get up at 3 in the morning and go spend two hours in the gym. That is prioritizing something. Prioritize what is important and find the time. If you're anything like me, you've said probably a, a million times, I, I, I got no time. I don't have any time. I've said that many times in my life. And I remember, um, I worked in the, like I just said a little while ago, I worked in the field. I worked in like the trades. And I used to get up in the morning. I, this was like framing houses and stuff. I was in a house framing crew for a, for a good time there. So I was wearing the, 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 the framing bags and I had the hammer and I had my, my like framing gun like looped into my belt and I had all these tools and I'd get up early in the morning, get there as early as possible, basically like sunrise to sunset. And if you've worked the trades, you know you know how hard it is, how physically exhausting it can be. And working sunrise to sunset and like every day, getting up early, going out there, physically exhausting myself during that period of time in my life. And I would come home after a long day of work and I would basically be able to do two things. I'd go take a shower, I'd eat dinner, and I would be in bed by like nine something. I could not, even if I wanted to, stay up later because I was physically exhausted and I knew the next day I had to get up early and do it all over again. There are times... When you're real tight on time, I get it. But during that same period, Sunday mornings would come around. And you guys might, you might, guys might know something about this. Like Sunday morning comes around and you're getting to that like moment of truth time in the morning where, where you're maybe looking and rolling over to your spouse and you're like, are we going to church today? Are we doing this? It's that moment of truth. And so... There was many a Sunday during that period of time, that season in my life where I'd roll over and I'd look at my wife and I'd be like, babe, I'm tired. I've had a long week. I'm not really feeling it. It's like 15, it's far away. It's like 15 minutes away to church. And if we hit a couple of red lights, it's going to be like 17 or 18 minutes. I think we just, we just skip it for today, right? And I was leading my family like that. And I was skipping. And then, then how many of you know, like, you start skipping. You start making routines, whether you want to or not. And then the routine becomes like, oh, I go to church. Like, I stay home more often than I actually go to church on a Sunday. Because who doesn't want to sleep till noon? Right? Find the time. I took, during that period when I was working in the in construction, my wife is from Columbia. We went down to Columbia to do a visit. And her father is a pastor. So that means my father-in-law is a pastor of a, of a church down there. And they have like a little, a little small denomination. It's like eight or nine churches. They're all federated the same denomination. And we were going around visiting the people and I was meeting people and stuff of all these different churches. One of the churches that we went to on a Sunday was like far outside of the city. We had to drive to this place in Colombia, which is called the Red Zone, which is like La Zona Roja. It's like where, where like usually you don't want to be hanging out because there's, there's a, a threat of violence, especially if you look different, if you're pasty and you're too tall and you stick out. Like people start looking at you like, like a paycheck, right? Like you're like, a walking, you're like a walking paycheck or something. And we went to this place, this little church in the jungle in Colombia, and I met the pastor there. And, uh, and he had just been dealing with like malaria or dengue fever, some, some terrible fever. He'd been like seven or eight days. He lived by himself at the church. 
And he was telling me like, oh man, yesterday was the first day I could, I could walk. I've had a fever. And he's telling me this story about how like he got up after having this terrible fe fever, malaria or whatever. And he got up and he's by himself, lives by himself. And he walks into this kitchen. He's like dragging himself into the kitchen for the first time that he's been able to move in a while. And as he walks into the kitchen, he sees that a jungle viper has snuck its way into the kitchen. It's a poisonous viper. And this guy who's like fresh off of this crazy fever had to go and find his machete and go there and kill a poisonous jungle viper in his kitchen like the day before I met him. <laughs> and he tells me this story, and I'm like, man, that's, that's, that's insane. Like, this is, we're, we're in the jungle, right? This is a different culture that we're in. This is not where I come from. And the Sunday comes, and people start showing up, and I start making small talk with the people, and I'm talking to them, and there's this one family, they're like a young couple, they're in their 20s, and they have like a bunch of little kids. They're like four or five little kids, and they're all like under six or seven years old. And I'm talking to them, hey, where are you from? And I'm asking people, uh, whatever, but where are you from? And, and they told me that they're from two and a half hours away. And I was like, wait, wait, hold on. Babe, can you translate this for me? Because I think I misunderstood that. They said that they came two and a half hours to get to church today. And she's like, yeah, they came two and a half hours to get to church. And I was talking to them. And I realized they didn't have a car. They didn't have a motorcycle. They got up in the morning and prioritized church so much that they got up early in the morning, took their little children all into the age of like six and walked through the jungle for two and a half hours. They said they came to a, a river and they put their children in a canoe, crossed a river in a canoe and continued their walk two and a half hours to get to church. And I was just coming out of a season where I was complaining about, babe, 15 minutes, 16 minutes if there's a red light, babe. Two and a half hours. And let me tell you, when, when service was over, they weren't, they weren't like just looking to turn right around and go two and a half hours and trek back home. All the people that came there were so excited to be around believers that they stayed together after the service was over because the church is bigger than a service. The church is actually its people. That taught me a tremendous lesson. That changed my idea of, of going to church and how far, what distance. i got to stop complaining about 15 minutes. These people walk two and a half hours. If they find the time, I can find the time too, right? You can find the time and in, 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 in the things that you're already doing. You can find the time during your workout time. Put in a podcast, some kind of a scripture reading, an audio Bible. You can find it during your breakfast or your lunch maybe. Everybody eats. Maybe take that time and say, all right, all my coworkers are going and doing this, but I'm going to spend this time and I'm going to dedicate this time where I'm already using to eat and I'm going to dedicate it to the Lord and I'm going to spend some time with him right now. You can do it, you can do it at night if you have young children like, like I do and you're already reading bedtime stories like a lot of kids, you read books to them at night. I spent, my wife and I spent the longest time with our children reading this thing right here, the Jesus Storybook Bible. This thing is fantastic for little kids. It's for like three to, to eight or nine years old. And, and I'll tell you, I'll be sitting there at night sometimes and I'm, and I'm reading through the stories and they're all illustrated for children. And I'm reading to like my five-year-old daughter about the birth of Jesus again because she's obsessed with that story for some reason. I'm like, can we read a different story? No, that one, okay. <laughs> and I'll be reading the stories and my, my children are having the, the scripture read over them. But I tell you the truth, there's times where I'm reading the stories to my little five-year-olds and looking at these little illustrations and I'm getting emotional. I'm like, this is so beautiful, Lord, thank you. Because the word of God doesn't return empty or void. You can use the, the storybook Bible. You can use the, the Bible in a year for an adult. You don't know where to start. We have Pastor Eric and I and a lot of people here use the Bible in a year. It's like one chapter Old Testament, one chapter New Testament every day. It's like 15 minutes. In a year, you'll go through the whole Bible. If you're like 9 to 14 years old and spending 10 hours a day on screen time, there's the Action Bible. Action Bible is fantastic, and it's made for people that age who would be drawn to like something visual. This was, this was illustrated by a guy who used to illustrate professional comics, the Action Bible. You can go in an audio Bible. There's audio Bibles that were made for inner city kids that don't know how to read. And they, make, they read the Bible over hip hop beats. And it sounds ridiculous, but it's for people who don't know how to read, who wouldn't come in contact with the word otherwise. There's a million different ways that we can plug in and connect and find time and prioritize spending time with God. So I came into contact with this scripture a couple years ago. It's actually a, a parable of Jesus. 
Because if you're anything like me, maybe motivation doesn't come super naturally sometimes. And I was working at another church, and I was, on, I was a pastor on staff already. There's three of us that preached regularly, and I, I knew that I was the least of the three. You know what I'm saying? It was like the, the, the one and the two were, were solid, and number three, which was me, was like quite a drop-off, if I'm honest with you. And if there was a fourth guy that was doing the, the, the teaching or whatever, I would have been now number four. And I knew that I wasn't the, ba- the greatest. I knew that I wasn't the best. I knew I wasn't as, as good as these other guys were. And uh, COVID hit and everybody was like stay at home and stuff. And the employees were still kind of, employers were still kind of trying to figure out what that looked like. And all of a sudden I had time on my hands, right? A little bit of time on my hands. And, and I was honestly squandering my time. I was playing video. I was playing Call of Duty Mobile several hours a day or whatever, right? There's plenty of things that I was distracting myself with. And as I was doing that, I was doing that for, for quite a, a period. I became stagnant. I became complacent. And I came across this parable of Jesus, this scripture of Jesus. And boy, this thing was a kick in my butt. Matthew 25. Jesus is talking to his disciples here. He's actually been talking about the end of the world. Matthew 24 is famously like, what are the signs of the end of the world? And Jesus is like, there's wars, there's rumors of wars, there's all this crazy stuff. And then the chapter changes to 25 and Jesus is still talking, still talking to his disciples. He tells two parables about the end of the world. One of them is called the parable of the bridesmaids or the virgins. And it's about 10 bridesmaids who are waiting for the return of the groom, but only five waits until he actually shows up. The other end of the world parable he, he gives is this one right here. It's called the parable of the talents. Some maybe call it the parable of the three servants. And we're going to read this parable today. Matthew 25, verse 14. And the synopsis of it is that there's a man going on a long trip. He leaves something behind to his servants. So this guy who's going on a long trip has a lot of resources and a lot of money. He has servants. And he leaves money behind to his three servants and he leaves and goes on a long trip and he comes back someday and there's an expectation of his servants that they did something with the money and the gift that he had given them in his absence. Really, the story is about Jesus coming back someday. It's end of the world stuff. Verse 14, Jesus says to his disciples, again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and he entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last. He's got three servants, five bags for one, two bags for another, and one bag for the third. And I don't want you to miss this part. It says that he divided it in proportion to their abilities, and then he left on his trip. So he doesn't give anybody something that they're not able to handle. He gives them according to their abilities. If he gives five bags of silver. It was to somebody who he knew could handle that. If it was two, to somebody that could handle that. If it was one, to someone who can handle that one bag of silver. Now, the funny thing about those bags of silver is that in Greek, it's called a talent. A talent was actually a measure. It was a measure, a weight of currency. And commentators tell us today that that weight of currency was 75 pounds So when it says bags of silver that the master left with his servants, he left 75-pound bags of silver, five to one, two to another. And even the one who had one bag of silver still had 75 pounds of silver. How many know you can do a lot of things with 75 pounds of silver? But it was within that person's ability. The person with one bag still receives a lot. Verse 16 The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money, and he earned five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work, and he earned two more. But the third servant, the one who had received the one bag of 75 pounds worth of silver, he dug a big old hole in the ground, and he hid his master's money. After a long time, their master returned from his trip. How many of you know Someday Jesus is going to return. 
How many of you know it seems like it's been a long time? It's been like 2,000 years, right? It seems like it's been a long time. How many of you can start to see through the fabric of this story, of this parable, and see that Jesus is talking about more than just a master and money? It says, after a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used the money that he left them. When the servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more, he said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver. In Greek, he says, you gave me five talents. And here I have earned five more. The servant, I'm sorry, the master was full of praise. He said, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling this small amount. He calls five 75-pound bags of silver a small amount. He says, you've been faithful with handling a small amount. So now I will give you much more, many more responsibilities. He says, let's celebrate together. Some translations say, enter into the joy of your master. Now the servant who had received the two bags of silver, he comes forward and does the same thing. He says, Master, you gave two bags of silver to me to invest, and I have earned two more. And the master again says, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this 150 pound bags, 150 pounds of silver, two bags, this small amount. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. And then there we come to the punchline. Then the servant with the one bag of silver came and he said, Master, I knew, I want you to catch this too. He's talking about the character of God. He's saying, Master, I knew you were a harsh man. He starts talking about his character. You're a harsh man. You're harvesting crops you didn't plant. You're unreasonable. And you're gathering crops you didn't cultivate. That's ridiculous. You're a harsh man. Read through the lines there a little bit. How many of us maybe know some people that would be tempted to say, Jesus, you're harsh. You're too much. You expect too much. Why? I don't even want to try. He said, I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here's your little money back. I'm going to dig up out of the hole. I'm just going to plop it there. Here's your money back. Good enough, right? Mr. Harsh Man, Mr. Harsh Master, Mr. Unreasonable. He's making excuses. He's making excuses. I don't even want to try. I don't even want to try with what you gave me because I was afraid because you're such a harsh man. I don't even want to try with these gifts that you gave me. I don't even want to try these things that you put on my heart, Lord, to serve your kingdom. And Jesus, excuse me, the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew, if you really thought that I was unreasonable and harsh, shouldn't you have done something? Shouldn't you have at least taken that money and given it to the bankers to get me some interest or something? But you just dug a hole? It says, wicked and lazy servant. And at that point in time in my life, I was spending way too much time doing a bunch of stuff and I wasn't prioritizing what's important and I wasn't finding the time. And I read this scripture I read this parable. Verse 27, why didn't you deposit in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest. And I'll read verse 29 here. He says, to those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But for those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. And I read that, and I was kind of shook. And I realized that I was convicted with like a good kind of conviction that I've been squandering my gifts because I was homeless. I was on the street. I was in programs. And even when I was in programs, there was something in the word and the scripture that called out to me. It just called out to me from the beginning of even knowing the Lord. There was something in these scriptures that called out to me. I knew that I had some kind of a gift and passion for the word, for teaching the word, but I was squandering my gifts And I would wonder, how come these other guys or everybody likes their teaching better than mine? How come I'm always the least of the three? Because I was squandering my gifts. God had given me something, a passion and an ability, and I was wasting it. 
And this convicted me. And I, from that day forward, I said, I know that I've had this idea to do like a little teaching series on the back burner for a couple of years that I want to teach through the book of the Bible, one of the books of the Bible. And the next day I went down in my basement and I started writing out and sketching out. I want to teach through the book of Matthew, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. And I was studying consistently. I want to be able to be able to teach and exercise my gift. And I started making videos, walking through the different chapters of Matthew. I started using my long car ride. It was an hour plus car ride to work every day. I started to use it exclusively for listening to scripture and listening to podcasts about the Bible and about scripture. An hour and 15 minutes one way, an hour and 15 minutes back. An hour and 15 minutes the next day, and an hour and 15 minutes back. An hour and an hour and an hour and an hour. And over months and eventually years, It made a huge difference in my life. And I don't think, I don't think I'm like God's gift to preachers or something. I don't think I'm like the best preacher in the world. I know that I'm not. But all I'm concerned about is I'm faithful with what God has given me. And when people hear about this kind of thing, sometimes the danger is like you think, oh, serving and, and, and God's stuff, that only belongs to the couple people on the stage. Like you're a teacher, that's easy for you to say. But God has given each of you uniquely gifts. He's put you where you are for his sake. There's things that you can do that I can't do. There's people on these teams that serve here at the church that are like mega encouragers. They're, 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 they're amazing. They have hospitality giftings. There's people that sign up when they hear somebody sick, going through a tough time, broke their leg, going through cancer. They're, they're making meals. They're signing up to make meals. They're doing whatever they can, using whatever gifts that they got for the kingdom of God. Don't squander your gifts. God has given you, actually give, maybe it's one talent, maybe it's one gift that's still more than enough. This isn't a message of like condemnation or something. The Bible says that we should be spurring one another on to good deeds. That also doesn't mean that, that we get to heaven because we do all these good works and God's like, great job, man, you did awesome. No. It's only by the finished work of Jesus However, a living faith will produce fruit. A living faith will produce fruit. So today, I want to encourage you guys to find the time. Prioritize what's important. If you have questions about where to start, I'm, we are so happy to help you with any of that stuff. You have the resources available. The Lord is good. He doesn't burden you with more than you can bear. Thank you, Lord. Father, we just thank you in this time and in this place, God, for how good you are. You're good. You are good, Lord. You've gifted us, each of us individually, Lord. People with different gifts, Lord, different abilities, God. Generosity, Lord. Encouraging teaching, serving, tons of different gifts, Lord. And the crazy thing is that you use and gift all these different people, all these different gifts, so that you might bind us all together and call us your family, your body. It takes more than one or two. Every body part has a function, Lord. And I just pray today, God, that you would speak to those of us who may have been squandering our gifts, Lord who may have been not prioritizing what's important, God, not finding the time when we could find the time, Lord, that you would meet us and have mercy on us where we're at, God. Speak to us, Lord, and call us on in you, Lord, that our living faith would produce vibrant fruit, Lord, in your name, because you're the one who can make that happen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.